Hello, I think we're ready to start. I see a lot of our middle school students are here. Thank you for coming. Great. So, good afternoon. Welcome, everyone, and thank you all for joining us today in this very important and meaningful event. My name is Fiona Wong, and on behalf of the VSSA's Parent Ed Committee, I want to express our utmost gratitude to our guests today for sharing their experiences and stories in commemoration of Holocaust remembrance. I first will open with a poem selected by my wonderful friend and co-chair, Monica Borokov. The Butterfly. The last the very last, so richly, brightly, dazzlingly yellow. Perhaps if the sun's tear would sing against a white stone. Such, such a yellow is carried lightly way up high. It went away, I'm sure, because it wished to kiss the world goodbye. For seven weeks I've lived in here, penned up inside this ghetto. But I have found my people here. The dandelions called to me, and the white chestnut candles in the court. Only I never saw another butterfly. That butterfly was the last one. Butterflies don't live in here, in the ghetto. By Pavel Friedman, June 4th, 1942. Pavel Friedman was born January 7, 1921, in Prague, and deported to Terezin on April 26, 1942. He died in Auschwitz on September 29, 1944. And with that, I will turn the mic over to our head of school, Mr. Mark McKee. Fiona, thank you for that poem. Um, thank you to you and Monica for your leadership in parent education and organizing this event for our really members of our whole community. We have here students, teachers, leadership, parents, grandparents, all here for today's event. And I just want to say one thing, which is especially to the students. If you think that an individual can't make a difference, um, that I, I hope you leave today with a different thought, um, that each and every day an individual can make a difference. You're part of a tradition today of Holocaust remembrance and of hearing personal stories of survivors that started because of a couple of individual students um, now six or seven years ago who came and invited the first uh, Holocaust survivors to speak to Viewpoint students. And we've continued that tradition as we have been able, uh, even through these times, and then branched out from there. Because remembrance is important. Sadly, the times that we're facing right now remind us that remembrance is important. There's a volume of poems. Uh, it's called Against Forgetting. It was curated by Carolyn Forche. And it is called 20th Century Poetry of Witness. And so it includes many poems from the Holocaust and um, from many other times of what uh, Forche calls extremity, times of human extremity in the 20th century. Highly recommend it to you. It opens with an epigraph. And, and the epigraph is, is a short poem, so I can remember it. <laughs> and it, it says, in the dark times, will there be singing? Yes, there will be singing about the dark times. And it's a memory that um, through remembrance, we can have change. And through remembrance, we can have optimism and life. And, and each one of us can make a difference. And uh, that's why we're here today. I, I'm incredibly grateful. Um, I, you're going to find out in just a moment uh, how fortunate we are to have Dr. Erica Miller with us. Um, <laughs> and uh, she's going to make a difference today in your life, as she has already in mine. Um, uh, my day is already brighter. Um, and uh, I know that our parents have made a difference organizing this parent education event. So um, 
Monica, thank you so much. Um, I'd like to introduce Monica Borkoff. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Today is a day of joy as we're gathered here at Viewpoint School. It's also a day that we acknowledge and bring attention to the horrific past, a past we've prayed and continue to pray will never be repeated and that people will learn from history. Please, God. Thank you to Viewpoint Administration and to Fiona, to parents and students here, and DLP, Dr. Erica Miller, and to Marissa and Benji, who will be having a conversation with you. I'm, thank you for um, being here, for honoring the past, and engaging in learning for now and for the future and for generations to come, and that we do have generations of families here today, the door by door. I'm honored to introduce our first guest of the afternoon, the David Lipkowski Project, its co-founder, uh, Leora Rakin, representing DLP. She's the great niece of David Lipkowski, and Jennifer Lopata, a parent of three Viewpoint alumni. Her husband, Robert, was on the Board of Trustees, and her company, Synergy Academics, sponsors the DLP Student Docent Program. The DLP has touched many people's lives, opened eyes, and enriched so many people, and there's so much more work to do and people to educate. We're grateful for your important and impactful work and your partnership with Viewpoint School, among other institutions, toward Holocaust education and your unwavering commitment to make sure that the world is a better place with sharing important lessons of life, survival, tolerance, acceptance, resilience, and the importance of bearing witness to history. It's my pleasure to welcome these two amazing women, Leora Rakin and Jennifer Lopata. glasses and wands, you can step into this painting 
and interact with the characters, learning about what life was like before the Holocaust. Now, what's interesting about David's art is that he often places himself in the picture. And I don't know if anybody can see where he is in this painting, if you look at it. Anyone? Yes. In the window. In the window? Okay. Anywhere else that you think you could see David Lapkowski, the artist? Very good. Okay. Right at the corner there, he's carrying his, his canvases, he's carrying his portfolio, he's walking along. Okay? And when we learn about David Lapkowski, whether as an adult or a student, the first thing that we actually learn is how to read his art. And so, just looking at this picture, what do you see and what do you think the artist is trying to communicate with you? Lizzie. I know you're really giving things. So sad you gave me your name. Just everyday life, bustling life in the city, people going where they need to go or getting their food or going off to work, just enjoying life. Enjoying that. Okay, what else? What else do we see? Uh, Sarah. Hmm, people, um, it looks like from this far away distance, but um, shopping and doing activities, daily activities, commerce, things like that. Okay, so daily activities, well, like going to the commons, right? Just like your normal everyday life. Having a drink with a friend, conversing, communicating, just everyday life. So David Lovkowski is living in Vilna, Lithuania. He's one of those people that's literally born with a paintbrush in his hand, not a great academic student. All he wants to do is paint and draw. What do you think his parents did? Send him to school. What else would his parents do? He's very concerned he's not going to graduate high school. All he wants to do is paint. Take his brushes away. What else? Any parenting ideas? <laughs> Very good. Okay, Diane. Diane Ben Davis. Get a tutor. All right. And that's exactly what, you know, they didn't have synergy academics there. <laughs> they got a tutor by the name of Rivka Lovkowski, my great aunt. She was two years older than him, spoke eight different languages, wanted to become a botanist. What do you think happened between them? Okay, much later, okay. David Lapkowski leaves Vilna, goes to um, Russia, and he applies to the very prestigious art school in Leningrad. He gets accepted, he's one of five people that's accepted to the Art Academy of Leningrad. Finally, he's living his dream, okay? And 1939, what happens in the world? World War II breaks out. What does Mother Russia mean? Soldiers. Okay, so David Lapkowski is forced to leave the art academy and he is forced to enlist in the Red Army. So, 1941, what's happening in the city of Vilna? The Nazis come in, okay? And immediately we see the discrimination and anti Semitic laws coming to existence. The Yellow Star, Jews being forced out of their homes and into exceptionally crowded ghettos. What happens to David Lapkowski during this time? He's in the Red Army. The ruler of Russia at this time is Stalin. What do we know about Stalin? He's a, he's a terror, okay? Right, he's not like a happy-go-lucky kind of guy, like, you know, I'm gonna be your friend forever. He's tyrannical, he's paranoid, that every single person is trying to assassinate him. So literally, you could be executed or imprisoned for almost anything. So for example, what's your name? Steve. Okay, so Steve, he walks in here, he didn't smile at me, all right? Obviously, Steve is planning to assassinate me, all right? It's simple. Steve needs to either be executed or sent to Siberia. And this is what happens to people throughout Russia. And David Lapkowski is sentenced to Siberia. Before that, he spends 10 months in the Lubyanka prison in Moscow, notorious prison. 
and then he is sentenced to Siberia. Anyone here been to Siberia? All right, not, not surprising. Negative 40, all right? Brutally cold, hard, hard labor. I want you to look at this picture and tell me what are you seeing, what are you feeling? Jennifer. What's your name? Yeah. All right. I just, I had a feeling. What are you seeing? What are you thinking? Beautiful. Excellent. Excellent. What else? Anything else that you've seen or you're feeling? What are we seeing in the background? Oh, watch house. So what is that telling you? Constantly being watched, no escape, as Jennifer said, gaunt, worried, all those emotions. How does he survive Siberia? How do you think he survives? Thousands and thousands of people die. David Lepofsky survives due to his artistic skills. And he becomes the prison tattoo artist. Just like prisons throughout the world, even today, when you become part of a gang, you get a tattoo, all right? So David becomes that tattoo artist, and in exchange, he gets a little bit of extra bread, an extra peel of potato. I want you to look at this picture, and um, tell me what you're seeing, what you're thinking. What you, David Lakowski's in the middle there. Very good. Benji, what else? Isolated. Isolated. Any other comments? Yes. What's that tube in the middle? Great question. And that's very much what we want to be looking at when we're looking at art and looking to understand it. What is there and what is not there? The absence and the presence. So what do we think that that is? Any ideas? Yes. A bucket. Why do you think that bucket is on it? Very good. And why do you think it's attached to him? Okay. That is your source of survival. Yes. Very good. Very good. So David Lopkowski is sharing with us his most intimate experience. This is like opening somebody's diary and they're not hiding anything. Even when they're sleeping, he is telling you what it was like. So this was one of the torture experiences that he had. It was known as the tunnel technique. And for 72 hours, prisoners were placed um, in a tunnel. You could neither stand nor extend your legs. And your feet were placed in freezing ice cold water. So David Lepofsky actually somehow survived the Siberian experience. And he comes back to Vilna, and what does he find? Complete devastation and destruction. 95% of the Jewish community has been murdered. And what does he start doing? He starts documenting. He starts painting the destruction, the devastation, and also the stories of the very, very few survivors. And this one over here is the forest of Konal, where the Jews of Vilna, they could not get the concentration camp. They were murdered in these camps. Now, David Lepkowski passed away in 1991. And he left behind this humongous body of artwork that when he had first shared it with the world in, 1950, in 1959, nobody wanted to see the images. Why do you think they didn't want to see them? Um, it was too, or... too painful, too raw, too close. And him and his wife, Rivka, felt so devastated by the reaction. Here they believed that their whole purpose, why they remained alive, was to document what had happened. 
and people just were not ready to see these images. And they decided that they didn't want to part with them. These paintings became like their children. And they didn't want to sell them. They hoped that one day a generation would come that really would want to learn from the artwork. And so in 2016, together with Stephanie Wilson, who was a parent here, and Jonathan Wilson, who was president of the board for many, many years, and all four of their kids went, and Jennifer Lapata, also DLP, we created a project-based educational program that uses the art as a vehicle, not just to educate, but that empowers students to be able to educate their peers. And how do they do that? By becoming curators and docents. Because as a curator, you need to know everything about the artist and the time period in which the artist lived. And in 2019, we had the most incredible opportunity together with Viewpoint, Viewpoint students, and students from Vilnius, Lithuania, and from South Africa, we co-curated an exhibit that opened in the Vilnius National Library. And we geoplotted the exact location where all the paintings had been depicted. And the students from Viewpoint and the Vilnius Lyceum led us around Vilna, concluding with a memorial service known as Kaddish at the forest of Honar, where together with all the people, I think there were 30 of us on this trip, we said Kaddish for my great grandparents who had been killed there. And what I said to the Vilnius students, because many of them did not know about this history that had taken place in their city. I said to them, it's not up to me to, to forgive you. You guys didn't, you didn't do anything. But your responsibility is to educate people, to educate your communities about what really, really happened here. And it really was this extraordinary experience taking this program back to Lithuania, back to the roots where it had happened, but seeing these students actually be the ones to educate their friends, their community, and their parents in many respects about this history. You can see Mark is making fun of there. Um, it, it was truly a surreal experience, and even when I look back at it now, it even seems more surreal given that Lithuania is on high alert, given the proximity to Ukraine. But we see a very honest portrayal of what happened to this community during the Holocaust. Now, it's not surprising. Everybody here knows there's been an incredible increase in the number of anti-Semitic incidences. And what we do at the David Lapkowski Project is we address, we identify, what are those anti-Semitic incidences, where is hatred occurring, what is happening with bigotry and discrimination, and our program addresses that through the art of David Lapkowski. And what Mark said, it's about one person. One person, one school, one community at a time. And so I want to recognize Marissa, where's Marissa? Marissa, as being appointed an international ambassador for the David Lakowski Project. <laughs> the work of our student docents, the work of our ambassadors is ongoing. Whether it's taking it to your school, whether it's bringing it to your college campus, whether it's educating people wherever you go, that is a true ambassador. And Marissa, the time, the dedication that you have given to this is extraordinary. I'm so, so proud of you. <laughs> and I know that your most precious time 
and um, your most precious asset in the school is obviously your kids. But secondly, it's time. Time is precious. So when a school gives time to Holocaust education, like Viewpoint has done, it is truly extraordinary. It's not the norm. It's the exception. And Mark, I want to thank you and Bob, this is for you, for journeying with us to really understand what happened during the Holocaust and to making sure it's never forgotten. Thank you. Thank you, Leora. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jennifer Lopata. It's absolutely my pleasure to be here today. An honor to, to honor Viewpoint School and Marissa Borokov and their unwavering commitment to Holocaust education. As the owner of Synergy Academics, an academic tutoring center in West Hills, we are so pleased to sponsor the David Lepkowski docent training program, which selects student ambassadors, including today's honoree, Marissa Borokov, one of my Synergy students, to be leaders at their schools, promoting Holocaust education and furthering the legacy of David Lepkowski and his artwork. With my professional career in education, I'm very passionate about this wonderful program and about the mission of ensuring that all generations learn about the Holocaust and so that we never forget. When it comes to never forgetting, I'm certain that you will be quite inspired by my dear friend, Dr. Erica Miller, our featured speaker. Erica was born in 1933 in Romania, and at age seven, she and her family were among thousands of Jews imprisoned in a Nazi holding camp in Mogilev, Ukraine. After four years of after four years of oppression and deprivation, Erica and her parents and her sister were finally liberated. Erica had no formal education while in the concentration camp. Entering school for the first time at age 11, she quickly learned the basics of reading, writing, and math. Her family emigrated to Israel in 1949, where Erica attended high school and served in the Israeli Air Force. She eventually moved to Los Angeles, where she shifted her focus from trauma to triumph, leading an extraordinary life, extraordinary life. To name a few, her accomplishments include earning a PhD in clinical psychology, operating a chain of mental health clinics, overseeing her family's real estate business in Austin, Texas, writing three books, and traveling the world with her beloved children and grandchildren. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Erica Miller. Leora, pretty depressing. <laughs> no, pretty sad. And mere fact, I was there in Ukraine. I'm absolutely glued into the television. It's like never again. What are they talking about? It will never not be. So again, our input, everybody matters, what you said before. But I must tell you, pretty somber. I had a little tear, and I don't cry very often. <laughs> so in a good note, I'm just absolutely grateful, all right, that I'm on this earth. I cannot believe my good fortune. So the atrocities of people and the kindness of people, I experienced both. So here I am, uh, 80 years later, can you imagine? I'm 88, look at me. <laughs> <laughs> I have to make us, because it's not fake news, but I have to make us laugh, because life is a mixed bag. And again, I am an example 
for the youngest, all of you. If I can do it, you could do it. Gift of life that keeps on giving. And by me not having, I know I'm going to go to my background. I still have five minutes, right? Okay. <laughs> yeah. That we are speaking about life choices we make, and then it's destiny. So we are speaking about everybody can make a difference. I know when I was little, I did not have a voice because we were hiding from the Nazis, and my mother's hand was on my mouth all the time not to give away our hiding place. I was a curious little kid, and again, I could give us away. So now look at me, and you have not heard yet. You get, I have a voice. I am relevant. Don't tell me I'm fearless. Don't tell me because I'm Jewish I have to die. Don't tell me because I'm girl and I cannot climb the trees with your voice. Don't tell me I cannot have a career, a family, and everything. So my point being is, I cannot believe my good fortune that I'm here with you, and you are hearing, oh, am I not loud enough? Recording, further recording. Oh, can I have this thing because I like to wiggle? Or do I have <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because the recording. <laughs> Either or, either mic works. Yeah. Either mic works, thank you. <laughs> All right. How about the other one? I'm pretty picky. Yeah. I come with the ones when I ever can get it. You don't always get what you want to say. You know what? Uh, what is that guy, the musician, huh? That's good. Okay. Uh, yeah. Mac Jagger, you don't ever get what you asked for. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I did my ending, I'll come back again. I need to, if I make you laugh, I'm telling you. Because again, it's about the kindness of people and the brutality of people. I experienced it both. Okay. Up till seven, here I go, I go back. Uh, up till seven years, I had a normal life, whatever that meant. As you can hear my accent, my mother tongue is German because my parents, when they were born in the same area, Chernowitzi, Bukovina, um, they spoke German. In the same territory then became, you know, the Romanian Nazis, and by the way, now it's Ukraine. And when I went back a few years ago, my darling daughter, she wanted to go back to see where those train stations might beginning. And I said, why would I want to go back? Let them go to hell. But I'm so glad that I listened. I took her there. And again, so she could see, you know, she could understand me because I'm really tough. Your children and parents, unless you're dying, no big deal. Okay? <laughs> Get over it. Be in the moment. Big deal. All right. So I'm a tough, I was really tough. I'm still tough. I made Mark, I make him laugh. That's a good thing. All right? Uh, and it's serious stuff. But my point being is, never mind so much my history, you could read it in my books. Not now, you're young, maybe in 10 years from now. You know what? It's like, uh, it's a story, uh, three-time authors, and I don't brag, I just share. Mm. <laughs> um, and so it is mainly about, you heard this story from Leora, and I know you heard before. So in very quickly, uh, up till seven, I was a normal family, whatever that meant. Mama, Papa, and in a family compound. By the way, the house is still standing there. And you now it's Ukraine. And when I went back with Diana, my daughter, uh, it says they're boycott Russia. So uh, Ukraine has issues with Russia then and now. And I am telling you how lucky you are to be in America. Your children, how lucky you are to be in this school. Somebody can afford it. You're smart enough. If not, you wouldn't be here. Mark, make sure that everybody is here is really smart. Huh? <laughs> so, you know, so my point being is lucky to be able to tell the story of survival, but not survival. It's a survival in beyond. So uh, I didn't get to choose it. Suddenly, there is mayhem. I'm seven years old. I see the contorted faces of my father, mother, and the uncles. We were in this compound, and it's like hiding in the in the attic. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, 
we are pushed, we are here at the train station. And I am telling you, the atrocities that I witnessed as a child, I was seven years old, nobody should. You know, people moving and, and pushing and grabbing the kids and baby and killings. I don't know, you're too young to have seen Schindler's List, the movie, anybody? Okay. So again, I was there, but I am who I am because of it, in spite of it. And we're speaking, but unfortunately, it will never not be. So then here we were in the train. So I see vision. I'm so very lucky. I'm very detached. And as a psychologist, uh, running 10 mental health clinics for about 40 years and seeing hundreds and thousands, who knows, who remembers? I'm a senior. I can get away with it. I don't remember how many people I saw. But it's like, yeah, I make a difference. A difference because there's a lot of pain out there. So, but when we were in, in, you know, seeing all that, I'm very detached. Does not mean that I don't have feeling. I have great empathy for human suffering. But again, for me to be able to share my life, to uplift people, it's like almost there's a mission in my life. There's a reason why I'm here today in addressing you. You're a young audience, which I like. Older people, kind of too late. But for you, you can move mountains. Are you kidding me? OK. Now, moving forward. Uh, being in the train station, and I'm speaking about resilience of species. Remember, we are all resilient. We are not dinosaurs. We are here. But this little kid that could not understand, I wanted to go and help Papa. They were beating him, and my mother holding on to me. And then being in this cattle train, and it's like being there. And all people screaming and crying, and me saying, how do, you, how do I entertain myself? What is going on? I think the worst thing is not to tell a child what's going on. Nobody, I ask, Mama, what's going on? Schmutzige Juden, dirty Jews. I'm not schmutzig, what's going on? Don't ask so many questions. So I have four years is an eternity, you guys. I, re I just remember flashes, I just remember certain things, four years, my memory, that was trauma does to you. So I remember being in the train in the corner, barely breathing, all those people, and singing to myself, it's like in a train, uh, cha, 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 you know, schmutzige Juden, schmutzige Juden, dirty Jews, dirty Jews. I was singing to myself to entertain myself. So that is the flashlight I have. And then I just we got sunburst. Every time they stopped the cattle train, they got some more people on, and, they, and they, uh, the Germans or the, or the Romanians, who knows, with, with batoneers, you know, with the sticks beating. And, 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 I, and I thought, I'm lucky to be in the back so they could not beat me. And then the train would go on, ta ta ta, ta ta ta, ta ta. And I don't know how long it took. I know that suddenly the train left. It came to a place, nobody knew where we were going, and we were going out from the train, it was, it was muddy, this and that, and we ended up in a holding camp. Uh, there were so many Jews that they didn't get to us fast enough, and it's just luck. I don't have the survivor's guilt. How come I survived and so many didn't? It was a holding camp, so for four years, uh, we were in a you know, hole there, and people died. <laughs> And people died from starvation and typhoid. Uh, you know, but they didn't get to us to, to, to burn us in the ovens yet. So the Russians liberated in 45, and then somehow barely initiated. They're all skeletons like that. We came back home and all that. And then you heard what Jennifer said. We were there a while. And the, you know, a lot of big stories in my first book. And then my sister, she was five years older. Uh, she went to Palestine, so Exodus to Cyprus. And then we were able in 49 to follow her. Uh, so uh, lucky of survival. So back to the camp, four years. I repeat myself. I can do it because I'm an elder. It's a long time. So I remember, just listen to that. I had to do something. It, it, I was not a baby. I already was seven, from seven to 11. It's like I remember looking out of this little window. I was a curious little kid. I'm not Einstein, but Einstein said the biggest thing of human condition is curiosity. OK, so I was a little Einstein. I looked outside the window, and I saw those dead people every morning, dead people, and those people, the Jewish people in, in outfits, came to pick them up on the wagon. 
And I looked there and I said, I thought to myself, and I remember that, that flash, uh, maybe I'll be dead tomorrow. I don't want to die ugly. Just before I die, I want to pose. Guess what? I'm still posing. <laughs> that is one thing I remember. I remember, you know, kids, I don't remember faces. We were those kids. So I have issues, eh, not many, but I have issues with intimacy, closeness. Why do you bother? They die on you. So I always, I never thought I wanted to get married. I never thought it was the kids. I mean, I am all that I have. I can always rely on me. So lucky that I went along with tradition and I did all of those. I was able to. So the dead people, jumping over dead people we played. I know that somebody had to, somebody had to teach me uh, writing and reading in, in, in physics. Because when I got out, the fifth grade, the first time back in Romania, I was in a Romanian Catholic school. Uh, Romania was Catholic. And I looked around, is there anybody else that doesn't do a cross? I was scared of Christians. Guess what? I'm not any longer. I figured out Jesus was my cousin. I knew him before the Christian knew him. So I'm really safe now. But I remember being in class fifth grade, and the teacher asking a question about Newton's physics, who knows what, I don't remember anymore. And I just looked around, I knew the answer. So again, do I out myself and go and, you know, and then maybe being beaten, or am I quiet? But again, look at me. I went to this, you know, and I, I solved the problem, and the teacher said, Look at this little Jewish girl. She barely speaks the language, Romanian. But look at her, she knows. What's the matter with the rest of you? So I'm a show off, I still am. <laughs> so again, no, I am defiant. Don't, I am absolutely, don't tell me in the same way, I've been branded. Don't tell me because I'm Jewish, I'm dirty, and I have to die. So I am so, I mean, again, Okay, I better, you know, that is not being scripted, not having anything to show in the back. I'm all over the place. Forgive me, but that's okay. So now back in the camp, uh, another flash. Uh, I was intrigued with a guard, the German guard. So my mother, we were 20 people in one room. And I am telling you that one woman among us she was there. Obviously, she lost. She got lost from the rest of the family. Her contorted face, her crying all the time. I was a little kid, seven, eight. I wanted to touch her. My mother held me close to her. It's like monkey. I was in Bali in Africa. Monkeys, they're all together like this. So that contorted face always followed me. I knew someday, I did not think that someday I have to become a healer to be able to touch that, that poor crying woman. So, uh, so that is another flesh. And eventually, when I had a husband and two kids, nobody goes back to graduate school when you have a husband and two kids. But when I felt safe, my son was first grade, I went back to school. Eight years later, I had my PhD. I opened 10 mental health clinics, ta 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 ta. It was tough, but I had to heal that contorted face. So coming back to the German Nazi, I wanted to see who that guy, big, big bad wolf. And my mother said, I'm a curious little kid. I always, I did not listen. I was, I, I, I never cried when I was hit. Don't tell me I cannot do it. So she mother said, don't you ever go to that, to that German, to that little place, that your guard. Guess what? I didn't listen to mama. I snuck up to this big bad wolf to look at him. And he turned around, he grabbed me, and you looked like this. What are you doing, little girl here? Who are you? What's your name? And I thought, here I did it. I didn't listen to mama. So I said, Erica. So, so help me. I don't lie. I'm not fake news. You don't have to believe me. <laughs> that the trauma does. He started like almost softening up. This rough face of this German looking at me down. He almost was tearful. It's almost like a change in his expression. And he sang this little song. And if that is not trauma, it was burned in my brain. He said, I have a little girl at home. Her name is Erica. And he started to sing, Auf der Heide blümt ein kleines Blümelein und es heißt Erika. On the meadow, there's a little wildflower called Erika. And then in a heartbeat, he was the monster again. He pushed me down on the floor. And I said, uh-uh. And he said, go back. It's not a place for a little girl. And I, I got up, 
And I turned around, he threw me a piece of ca a candy bar. And we are speaking about my take of the brutality of people and kindness of people. I experienced it both. And because I did not want my mama to know that I did not listen to her, I gobbled up that piece of the, the candy bar, and I felt guilty about it. But again, I didn't want to be punished. And then I started to have a relationship, and everybody was on guard. I snuck, and he sent me, threw me a candy bar. So when people ask me, especially a couple of times in his church, how do you feel about Germans? And I say, how do I feel about Jews? There are some good ones and some not good ones. I do not hold the children responsible for the sins of the fathers. So my point being, if I say I'm a citizen of the world, I am. I've traveled all over the world. And I don't brag, I just share. Can you imagine? I've been in 196 countries. I did not even know there are that many. Huh? My granddaughter, Shana, she put them all there. So to me, a citizen of the world means there's the yin and the yang. And I'm not just a survivor, I'm a thriver. I'm absolutely part of the universe. And so being in Israel and being the majority, and in Israel, I don't know if you know or not, girls and boys have to go for two years in the army after high school. Most of those days, nobody went to high school. I needed to learn. And I went at night school, and then during the day I had two jobs, and I enlisted. And I said, I'm going to go to the Air Force because I like the blue uniforms. The green are kind of boring. So I am in, the, in La La Land. I think whatever I want, somehow I get it. Maybe what I don't get, I don't remember. So I went two years in the Air Force, and I'm telling you, girls and guys, I had such crushes on those officers and those pilots. <laughs> oh, my gosh. And by the way, Azar Weizmann, he used to be then the president of Israel, one of the presidents. He was my commander in chief. Boy, did I have a crush over him, too. And when he died a few years ago, he was only about five years older. So my point being, so two years in the Air Force, in being the majority, in being relevant, in being tough, I'm little but mighty. By the way, I just had a physical. Uh, I, I'm a little bit less than five, uh, five feet. Uh, I told my, my boutique doctor, I will never lie about my age. I'm flaunting it so the young people can follow me, but I'll never be less than five foot. Do you hear me, Dr. Komba? So my point being is, how lucky I'm in a life. The song of my life is how lucky I am. I really feel very strong that uh, all Jews should be in Israel because the country needs us. Uh-uh. You know what? We need to be all over the world just the way we are. So destiny had it. I thought that I would be in Israel forever after the Air Force. I worked in the uh, Israeli government tourist information office because I learned English in high school. All my girls then got married so they don't have to go to the army. But I thought that they were kind of, they missed the point. So you know what? I just came, I thought I dated somebody. I really was not into it. And I'm not going to give you the, uh, the details of my private life. OK, you're too young for that. Yeah. OK. <laughs> but it's like I dated this guy, Moishi, and everybody expected me to get married. My mother was really worried I'll never find a husband. I was an old maid of 23, 24. In those days, you get married at 18, so you don't go to the Air Force. You go to the Army. So I said, I will travel all over the place. Are you kidding me? A single old maid going by herself? Huh? My sister, meantime, relocated in Los Angeles. So I went, I went to just visit. Uh, the government uh, office gave me, it was winter time, they gave me a month's vacation time. And then destiny happened. It's very weird how people end up together. Uh, my husband, uh, Jerry, somebody happened to be there. Uh, it's a story of, of, of uh, destiny. We met up, and it was the end. There's no way I could not marry him. I was an old maid of 25, I guess, at that time. So I stayed in Los Angeles, and I felt so very guilty that I'm not, I used to judge Israelis. So the point being is, uh, I then, uh, you know, but, so I married, whatever, and then I, you know, opened clinics and all that kind of thing to be irrelevant, to make a difference in the world. And guess what? Who do I think I am? I'm Jewish, but I'm not chosen. I don't know about nothing. I just know that I'm relevant. I'm still here. And I make a difference to uplift people. Because people are scared. You know, life takes courage, likes whatever, failure. So when I lecture, people follow me with selfies. 
they want what I got. So there is a reason, there's a reason why I'm around here. My positive uh, take on life. I have energy and it's like, no, I'm not in La La Land, you know, but I'm just lucky and grateful that I have gift of life that keeps on giving. And I will be interviewed, I will be Marissa, because I can go on forever. I'm a, you know, a storyteller, are you kidding? Yeah, you're going to ask me, uh, you, one of the questions I think I saw, what are the things I'm most proud of, right? So maybe I shut <laughs> So I'm going to shut up if you want to. I don't know how much time I have. You can start. Huh? I can keep on going? Wow. Okay. No, the biggest thing is to me, are you making fun of me again, Jill? No, I like, because then later Marisa's going to interview me, right, Marisa? Huh? Okay, yeah, because yeah, because the biggest thing is it's asking questions to interact with the audience, and you are my audience, whether it's audience of one or two, I just like I'm, I'm you know of, of thousand. Guess what? I'm speaking in front of a lot of people. It doesn't matter. It's the questions because you know I mentioned it wherever somebody heard me before. Uh, people are scared to ask questions. When somebody has cancer, you don't want to say the word cancer when indeed people want to talk about it. In my case, I had 40 psychology psychiatrists working for me for about 40 years. Nobody ever asked me, nobody ever asked me about the Holocaust because they're very afraid that, you know, to ask the question. So to me, nothing is off the table. And I can tell you, sometimes I'm rough because, you know, what I see is what I say and it's not politically correct, so I have to watch it. Huh? So, uh, yeah, but the interaction, because there's nothing, because we're speaking about its human condition. And when I see now, when I see Ukraine, when I see, I don't need to see it. it it's in Vietnam or it's in Somalia. It's the brutality of people always will be, it will never not be. Let's not forget. You know what, yeah, it's nothing, it will always be. But we, by having a voice, by, by reminding, by being kind, involved in the community, we make a difference. In my last book, where, where am I here? Okay. All right. My, uh, I, I think I have enough. This is, uh, this is a book marker, and, and some of you still read books. Hey, give me your hands, how many read books? Ah! Okay, I think I have enough for everybody, one of those, and it's a really good exposure for a business. I'm a business person, are you kidding me? It's a really good, well, you're not going to throw it away because it's a bookmarker, huh? So the last book that made me international bestseller, I don't brag, I share again, Crazy Man. I wanted to know how long do I have a chance to live? So that is the biggest thing because death gives meaning to life. I have a very weird relationship with death because it's not if, it's when. And don't freak on me. I already have my casket in the bottom of my bed. It's a friendly reminder. It's the end of life. So I can be present in the moment like crazy. So I wanted to know how long can I live? So I, the, the book is chronologically gifted, living long and healthy, 123, starting all over the world. People that are centenarian and super centenarian, how, what does it make for them to live that long? And somebody just died. I got an email from somebody, 119. But the, one, uh, the woman that lived, so my research says, uh, the woman that died at 122 in 64 days from France, Bonnet, and I decided, uh, follow me, watch me, I decided to lift 123. If she could lift 122 in 64 days, I will lift 123 and be in the Book of Guinness. You heard about Book of Guinness, huh? Okay. So yeah. We all know, so what, what that book shows in a journal, whatever, it is to, yeah, we all know about wiggling, exercising, and, and, and working out. I'm pescatarian, I walk three miles, I, you know, but I take care of myself, but then it's also destiny. So it was very good for me to see the possibilities are endless. So when I say I will live till 123, I could. There's already somebody born. I'm a researcher. It's crazy what I, what's going on. Huh? 
100, somebody already is here, maybe you young and 150. And not just living, and not just living long, living well, but one of the important factors is what you know already, is being engaged in the community. Having faith is a wonderful thing. Uh, being spiritual, whatever, because there's more than us. And I see, I don't know much about your school, but I have a sense that you are the right way. And so, you know, go, go for it, because life is an amazing journey. There are about four chapters, 30, 30 uh, is 120, but I will lift 123. So my rabbi said, oh my gosh, you're going to lift 120. I said, rabbi, it's boring. In the Bible, 120, I want to lift 123. So it's a possibility. Okay. Okay. I was going to I'll say the thing. I So Marissa and I had some questions, but I think just about every single one of them was covered. Um, so we have one final closing question that we'll ask you. Um, so we heard that there is a movie being made about you. Is there really a movie being made about you? And who will play you in that movie? That's our closing question. <laughs> you mean I answered all the other questions? Every already? single one. <laughs> And guess what, you guys? You're so lucky now that the microphone is open. And once I say who I think are going to play me, you can ask questions. We still have time, right? We have about five more minutes. Oh, okay, okay, okay. All right. I always saw I always saw a movie, not a documentary movie of my life, not because of me. It's the story of a, a fearless little kid, a female. So I find like other scripts. So there's now, check him out. He's really good and handsome too. Wow. Kevin Bernhardt. He is a writer, producer, uh, made about 30 movies. And the script is ready. Now we are just having to put together who's going to play me. The biggest thing is economics, you know, but then you have to raise funds and all that kind of thing. And the title of the movie is, it is a period when I decided, when my son John went to first grade, I decided now is the time is safe for me to go back to school and get my, my PhD. Nobody wanted me to, are you kidding me? She's going to run away with the crazy psychiatrist? Are you kidding me? So again, so we are speaking about uh, that kind of thing. That is kind of, an, and my parents came from Israel to help me out, and my husband was a comedian. The stress that he was the mother and the father and all that, it's a really, it pulls at your heartstrings. It's a really good one. Now, who do you think, I'm not in charge, who do you think should play me? Because remember, I was 38, 39. I think, um, what is her name? Uh, you know, the one, you know, blonde one, she could be my mother. Ha, ha, I forget, but who do you think my third is? Tell me. No, okay, I was thinking Goldie Hahn, my mother, and her daughter could be me. She could, you know, at 39 or 40, and they have a grandkid, maybe my little, a little kid or something, or maybe her husband or the, the man she lives together. I don't think they're married, Goldie Hahn, huh? Maybe he can play Jerry, a comedian. So I don't know, but again, it's like really exciting. And guess what? I was accepted in the, in the Air Force. I have vision and things happen. Watch me. There will be a red carpet. I don't know whether you're all going to be invited, but <laughs> I, have, I have a website, Dr. Erica Miller. Feast your eyes now that you met me, because all my in speaking engagements, by the way, the question's not there. I am fearless. I climbed. Uh, Inca Trail, 11,000 feet, about five years ago, and then base camp, uh, uh, base camp um, in in uh, Mount Everest, 16,000 feet. I jumped out of a plane with my granddaughter in 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 New, in, uh, in, Nucle in New Zealand. I just zip lined, okay. <laughs> And I will go next year, I'm going to go to Kilimanjaro. And, uh, you know, because it's 19, I don't know whether I'll be able to. I don't have to prove nothing. But life is absolutely an amazing journey. I'm not telling you to jump out of the plane. <laughs> but it's like keeps me going. It was so good being in front of you. I think I better shut up. <laughs> <laughs> huh? Oh. Um. 
Thank you so much, Erica, for coming and speaking to everybody and for being here and sharing your story and sharing your story of following what happened, just the courage and the resilience and the determination that you've had throughout your life. I really appreciate hearing you and you coming here. So can we get another round of applause for her, please? Okay, now the last thing is remember, if I can do it, you can do it. Uh, the, you know, it's, it's limitless. The future is yet to be. And, uh, and I hope I have enough for everybody. If not, I can give you some more. Give out everybody that looks nice and smiles at me. <laughs> we have some bookmarks up here from Erica and also some materials from the David Lubkowski project on the table. And we can pass out the bookmarks. But you're welcome to stay and talk to Erica after. And thank you all for coming. Thank you.